I'm happy to introduce uh, Irina Sirotkina, uh, PhD, uh, Institute for the History of Science and Technology of the Russian Academy of Science, Moscow, who will talk on cyborgs or wearable technologies, uh, commentaries on the future body in the Neuralink project. Irina. Um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, absolutely. Uh, good. Um, so, uh, yes, indeed, my, my topic is very um, connected. I'm happy to say that I will uh, take over Helena's um, uh, ideas, some of her ideas, and um, also talk about boundaries. Uh, and uh, uh, this time, it will be the boundary between uh, the body and the prosthesis. Uh, can I share my screen with you? So uh, we were talking about we're back to cyborgs, uh, but uh, uh, along with cyborgs, I will talk. I would like to talk about wearable technologies, and I use this term quite uh, loosely, meaning also um, prosthesis, especially bioprosthesis or bionic prosthesis, which have been developed for the last uh, uh, half a century. And uh, you can see it's an action of promoting uh, bioprosthesis. The uh, uh, French government body um, uh, showed, demonstrated the Venus with uh, bionic arms in um, uh, the French Paris underground. And for this image, and also for help with um, thinking and um, uh, with the pictures, I thank Ludmila Arlanova, uh, the graduate student of uh, the design school of the HSE. Um, so uh, the word, the, the terms, talking about the terms, the term cyborg, um, Donna Harvey was mentioned, but she didn't invent the term. The term comes, it's also about uh, um, half a century old, and um, it, it was invented by a physiologist who uh, experimented uh, in the framework of space research. Uh, and created a, um, a mouse, a, a rat, uh, technically um, supplied with um, uh, um, syringe, which injects uh, uh, some liquid, which maintains the uh, blood pressure in the living organism, uh, supposing that the blood, blood pressure may go wrong uh, in space. So um, cyborg, is, uh, in, in one word, is a uh, uh, whole organism, an integrated organism, and it's something different, and in this way it's something different from wearable technologies, uh, where we can put, the user can uh, put some, some the wearable technologies on and take it off. Um, in the cyborg, it, it can't be separated, it can't make, make separate, so let's use the, the terms in um, their meaning, the strict meaning. So uh, what is about the prosthesis? Uh, in 2013, uh, a prestigious making company, Touch Bionics, uh, claimed that they were able to rebuild more than 50% of the human body. Uh, about the time they built the latest uh, iteration of uh, an arm prosthesis with each finger driven by its own motor. Touch Bionics call it the eye limb, like an eye phone, there's an eye limb. And David Gao, a Scottish engineer who created the eye limb, uh, says one of the most significant accomplishments in the field of prosthetics uh, has been making amputees feel whole again and no longer embarrassed uh, to be seen wearing an artificial limb. This humanistic motive was shared by several makers of the functional mechanical limb, uh, beginning with the very first one, the 16th century French battlefield surgeon Ambroise Paré. He invented a hand with flexible fingers operated by catches and springs. Uh, it wasn't a bionic arm, but it was a not very well articulated mechanical prosthesis, as you can see. He also created prosthesis for um, legs. The same vision inspired the Soviet military surgeon uh, Viktor Semyonovich Gurfinkel. Uh, he passed away only this year in the um, very much your age uh, of um, 98. After having done so many, he, he was a, a, um, a battlefield surgeon during the Second World War. Uh, and actually he started um, in 1940 with the war in Finland and uh, went on till the 
uh, end of the war and uh, ended uh, the war in Berlin. Uh, so uh, he um, was a surgeon, as I said, and he took part in many amputations, as you can imagine, uh, during the war. And after the war, he was determined, it was his decision, it was commitment uh, to give limbs back to the amputees, to former soldiers and officers. And this is uh, in as a, as a young man uh, after the war, and then um, the head of the laboratory at uh, the Institute of uh, uh, Information Transmission in Moscow, doing uh, space research experiments. And uh, the, the last picture is, uh, I took it when I interviewed him eight years ago in Portland, you see. Uh, Gurfinger embarked on a new career and he eventually became one of the first Soviet specialists in bionics. With a team of neurologists and mathematicians, he made the artificial forearm controlled by muscular sig signals in the residual limb. Moreover, the inventors persuaded the Soviet healthcare ministry to start an industrial production of the prosthesis. Although prototypes, I mean, the, the functioning models, a single copy of a functioning prosthesis existed prior to it. They were made by uh, German um, prosthesis engineers. This was the first um, the bionic arm that, that was uh, mass, uh, mass produced, was industrially produced. Um, and um, the priority in making the first industry produced bionic arm belongs to the Soviet team, handed also by Gurfinke. The Soviet bionic arm was made one size suited for men and one color, which is quite understandable, I think, given the poor economic uh, conditions of the post-war years. Recently, it was accused, uh, the whole project of creating this arm was accused, was criticized as sexist and racist. Um, that I was very surprised uh, when I heard it. I can't give you the exact reference, written reference, but I'm quoting here a colleague who told me that she wanted to study, she's a historian of science, she wanted to study the fact that the bio arm was one size and one color. The implication was she finds it uh, problematic and even outrageous. I remember my uh, shock by this criticism. Uh, of what my, one may think was uh, the most humane project to restore the wholeness of a wounded person. How did this change of uh, optics, how did this shift of use, view come about? It was possible, I think, it's my hypothesis, which I want to share with you. Um, it was possible because the prosthesis, as many of human technologies, um, has more than one end. It can be functional, as well as decorative or cosmetic. In the latter case, uh, if it's cosmetic, it is called a wearable technology. In fact, before it became mechanical and functional, the arm prosthesis uh, was indeed for cosmetic purposes. It wasn't a, a functional uh, device. It was just to conceal the absence of a uh, limb. In the majority of cases, it still remains so. Even the most advanced bionic arms are worn for appearance and not used functionally. This was the secret that Viktor Gurfinkel shared with me when I interviewed him in Portland. Uh, the production of the bionic arm, I mean the Soviet bionic arm stopped after uh, several hundred copies have been produced. And why? It, uh, they stopped simply because it was not used as intended. It was not used to um, take, to grasp things, to uh, turn things, to use it instrumentally. It was used for cosmetic purposes. And the question is why? The, the person is given such a powerful instrument uh, so he or she can use it at, at um, full. Why? Um, and the answer that Gurfinkel gave to me, and you can well guess, the, the secret, it was much easier to learn to do things with one remaining arm uh, than to uh, learn how to control the bionic arm. 
and the cost of bioprosthesis, which was much higher, much, much higher than the cost of an old-fashioned cosmetic prosthesis. So it was a waste of money from the consumer's point of view to purchase a bionic arm and then use it for cosmetic purposes only. So the problem, I claim that this problem remained ever since. Bionic devices, which were to transform humans into cyborgs, continue to be used either to improve appearance, uh, for cosmetic uh, purposes, and are rarely used for uh, the, the purpose intended. Um, bionic engineers, however, think otherwise. Hugh Hare, uh, a biophysicist and engineer who is the director of the biomechatronic, biomechatronics group at the MIT, uh, claims that prosthetics are improving so quickly that he predicts disabilities will be largely eliminated by the end of the 21st century. Hare was a 17-year-old when he caught in a blizzard while climbing New Hampshire's mountain Washington in 1982. Um, he was very skilled and so on, and uh, uh, after losing uh, both of his legs, who were frostbitten, uh, which were frostbitten, uh, Hare designed his own legs optimizing them to maintain balance on mountain ledges as narrow as a dime. He personally uses eight different kinds of specialized prosthetic legs. Uh, and he claimed that this uh, choice, this is credible choice of limbs, incredible choice of legs, he can be uh, tall, he can be, he can run, he can climb. Uh, it's to his advantage to have this, uh, the same um, this range of devices, but at the same time, every advantage has its um, um, the, the other side, and the other side is um, um, that human is functionally so much more universal than um, any of these prosthesis. So for each function, he has to change basically a pair of, pair of legs. Uh, a person with two uh, legs don't have to do that. The legs can do all these functions, while with a, um, bioelectronic, bio biomechanical devices, you have to choose, you have to change devices. Um, yet prosthesis engineers uh, try to turn um, this shortage into advantage. At one of 10 talks, Emma Mullins, a Paralympic champion and a model with disability, said the following about prosthesis. It's not about correcting inferiority, but about potential. The artificial limb is no longer a loss, but a symbol of, of the fact that its wearer is able to fill the void in any way he wants. He becomes the architect and designer of his body. By combining modern technologies, robotics, bionics with poetry, I, I think she means imagination, fantasy, um, we better understand what human nature is. Um, uh, wearable technologies are much easier um, than uh, talking about coming back to the cyborgs. We, we can see that prosthesis or wearable technologies are much easier to take um, on and put off. The cyber, in the cyborg, you can't separate. But even in this case, it's um, not uh, uh, given, you can't take it for granted that your body will accept these devices and you won't need to change them for each particular thing you do. Um, it is hardly surprising that the individual wants to be in control of his or her own body and that they are conscious of their appearance. This is why the latest version of the bionic arm called the eye limb, designed for a nine-year-old, looks at, like a tattooed arm. It is clear that Josh Cuthcart, he is uh, here on the left upper picture, is proud of his robotic hand. Technologically, it's not so different from the early Soviet bioprosthesis. I mean, the scheme the same is the same, but uh, the design is different. It uh, has become much uh, brighter, much more uh, fashionable, uh, a designer's arm. But in, in the core, in, in, in the depth, it's the same uh, prosthesis as we saw um, Gorfinkel and his team created. The same applies to the Immaculate by the Norwegian designer Hughesclap. Uh, in spite of its futuristic look, it's, um, 
it's made of plastic and fabrics. The designer also abandoned the imitation of leaving only three of them, <clears throat> but wider the shape. The artificial hand is built on a foundation created by Gurfinki and, uh, um, and others uh, back, which was suggested um, in the uh, mid-20th mid century. Finally, <clears throat> it's my last slide, in uh, uh, 2017, the cyber designer from St. Petersburg, Nikita Riplansky, and his colleagues from Motorica demonstrated at the Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week Russia two conceptual prosthesis for adults. Artificial arms definitely become more attractive for uh, users. Yet one may suggest that in their functionality and comfort, they have as much constraints and limitations as before. And um, as a conclusion, we can speculate that um, one of the problems is that there is a, a large gap between my own body, the phenomenological body, the way I, I feel my body, and any other uh, objects. You can't just combine them. You can't add uh, your body to uh, an object, or rather an object to your body, because there, there is an existential uh, gap between them. Uh, I feel my own body is completely different from any object in the world. And uh, um, all these objects are, 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 are remain wearable technologies. They're, they are not integrated into the body scheme unless you start very young, uh, very flexible, uh, unless you uh, used to uh, learn and control it in a very young age. That's my uh, suggestion. Thank you very much for your attention. Irina, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, uh, indeed, I um, communicated with uh, engineers uh, from uh, Motorica at some point, and they, uh, they confirmed that people still prefer to use traditional prosthetics and, uh, you know, uh, rather than learn how to use uh, bionic prosthetics. And you also suggested this age difference. I think that could be interesting point to see if younger users are more, let's say, flexible in the way they start, you know, learning how to do that. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a comment from Lainey uh, about uh, Amy Mullins, uh, and she also adds uh, Victoria Modesta, singer, bionic singer, as she uh, calls herself, uh, because they are bringing together fashionable prosthetics uh, with function as some models on the catwalk, like Mama Cax. So, uh, yeah, question from Ksenia Gusarova. Aren't smartphones almost seamlessly integrated into our body scheme? <laughs> Well, uh, uh, not for me, <laughs> maybe for a very young, young person who has all the time by the bed, bed, uh, bedside, uh, but um, for me it's quite difficult to learn how to use it. Yeah, I, I, th I think yeah, it's, it's a good point actually, and uh, there was an article uh, in Fashion Theory at some point uh, years ago uh, about the way uh, the very nature of garment has been reconsidered these days and smartphones and other gadgets and some, you know, artificial organs, you know, have become already part, our, part of our bodies. So, yeah, right. Uh, do, we, do we have any other comments or questions? Okay. Right. So, just let me check if YouTubers... Uh, commenting on anything is because we have we have different channels, you know, following. I feel myself. I feel a uh, future human today, multitasking. Okay. Uh, well, no comments. How about Alexander? Uh, Alexander Persheva wanted to say something. No. Okay. Yes, we have one. Uh, could you comment on the connection between how the society perceives body and the use of wearables? For instance, the early ones were meant to replace the missing function, and today it's an aesthetic turn. Um, yeah, I think I, I, my, my talk was about it. It's, um, uh, it's a, the, the, there is a lot of uh, choice. You know, the, the users, the amputees, basically, people without limbs, are offered a huge choice. And if you um, look uh, around this, all, all this um, uh, construction, engineering agencies create uh, 
um, procedures, they all they all say, oh, how wonderful our bio arm was, I limb is, is just perfect. But in fact, what they offer, and some of them realize it, some of them are, are don't, that they offer a, a cosmetic procedures, first of all. They use it, uh, they, they, um, they motivate people by the aesthetics of it, not by the uh, comfort in using, not by the... Um, uh, the fun functionality, but uh, first of all, they uh, motivate the users to buy it for the look. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a question from Alina Kantarova. And uh, the next one is from Alexander Persheva. How about prosthesis with AR? Do you find it useful, the kind of thinking prosthesis which predicts one's, one's movement? Well, it's at the cutting edge. I, I actually I was going to to talk about uh, Elon Musk's project, the Neuralink, but then I decided it's too much. <laughs> but uh, if you mean uh, the uh, brain computer interface, yes, they are um, uh, they're offering something else. They they try to offer more, but it's um, at the the very uh, embryonic stage. Uh, I would say so. We will wait and see. Mm -hmm. And one comment from YouTube. Question: uh, Could such uh, such prosthesis uh, be seen as additional parts uh, of the body, not as a replacement, but as a development of uh, sensibility, as uh, bringing in something new? Mm. Yes, that's what Amy, Amy Mullins was commenting about. That uh, it, it gives you more opportunity than she would have even having both legs. Um, but uh, I think it's very much depend on the individual attitude uh, it, and how creative one can want to be. But it's not universal, it's not for everybody. Mm 